So we're really excited to have Christina with us this evening. Um, and her talk will look at how the ocean is reacting to climate change. So from a sailing boat to the web, we'll explore how the chemistry of the ocean is changing with dramatic consequences for marine life. We'll explore the digital artwork, diving into an acidifying ocean, which was realized in collaboration with Google Arts and Culture and is a web experience that uses data to visualize the process and the consequences of ocean acidification. Christina Tarquini is an Italian art director and creative technologist based in Paris, design, designing visual storytelling for immersive experiences. Her digital practice is getting more and more focused on climate and social issues that are reshaping the 21st century. Christina's work has been shown internationally at Somerset House, experiments with Google Arts and Culture and Ars Electronica. So we're really excited to um, have Christina to speak this evening. I'll pass on to you, Christina. Thank you very much, Melanie and Louise, and uh, good evening or good morning to everybody. Um, yes, so my name is Christina Tarquini, as, uh, and as Melanie said, I'm an art director in creative technology now, uh, technology, sorry, now based in Paris. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about my practice and a little bit about what I do. And then uh, we're going to uh, literally dive under the ocean from the web and, um, and uh, talk a bit about what's happening in the, in my, in the, in, in the ocean. So I'm going to share my screen, hopefully without any glitches. So hopefully you can all see my screen. Um, yes, so my name is Christina Tarquini. And uh, basically what I, uh, as, as also Melanie uh, mentioned, I basically use visual arts and uh, coding to, to tell stories. The way I, use, uh, I, I do this usually has a, a, very, a very different outcomes. Um, and I'm going to show you some, some examples of, of how I tend to do this. So, for example, in this, in, in this project here, we, I was, uh, sorry, I'm going to just move this from here. Okay. So, in this project, I was fascinated by um, the, the brain and how, uh, and, and the thinking process that we all do. We all, um, I'm, I'm sure you've all been in a situation when you really try to focus on something and your brain goes all over the place, scattered and, and escapes without you, wanting, uh, without you wanting it. And I was really fascinated to this and I gave myself the challenge of how, how would it be possible to visualize something like this? So uh, I got myself an EG reader that you can see this gray little thing in the, on the forehead on, on the picture there, so that I could literally access the, the brain of, of, this, of a person. So in, in this case, this, this uh, artwork is a, is a print and it works that I, I, I would take a picture of, of the, the person, put this EG on, and let this person uh, breathe deep, deeply and try uh, to to stay focused and not and not let the brain wander too much. Um, um, so after I took this picture, the, the person starts thinking, and through coding, then I, I can modify this portrait. And as you uh, creating these beautiful patterns, as you see in some areas, there's uh, lots of vivid colors. Everything is a bit all over the place, and some others actually you can recognize the, the person there. And this is basically how I was trying to visualize the the, the thinking process. So where there are uh, vivid colors and and the colors are different, it means that the person was in a meditative state, was managing to control, let's say, the mind. Whereas when you can see the person itself, the, the person was wandering away, the mind was wandering away. And so this is a bit how I give myself this challenge of visualizing something that is very hard to normally see. Okay. Uh, this is a bit the con continuation of the previous project where from a print uh, outcome it became a video, a sort of performance video, where this in this time uh, with the EEG reader the person was challenged to, to again to meditate, to try and control the mind and meditate and by moving, uh, by meditating I moved the, the pixels of the um, of the of of this video via a webcam, so that the more the person was meditating, the more the pixel were, were coming together, um, and and identifying a bit the person behind. 
Another example um, of, of uh, basically way of uh, storytelling through, through coding was um, playing around with virtual reality. We created an installation here at the Ballet School of Architecture in London. And uh, we created a very Terrellian world where the, the user would wear this Oculus Rift that was attached to an inflatable balloon. And because it was literally attached to the balloon, the, the user was faced, was squished onto this inflatable structure that had, they felt uh, natural to hug and interact with. So as the user would do in this, would um, with this movement of its arm, would shape the, the virtual world they were seeing in, in VR. And it was a world that, uh, Tyrellian in the sense that was actually shaped by the light and the light that was moving with the movement of the body. So it was very much to transpose the user into this uh, abstract and, and uh, very colorful world that can be explored through the movement in the real world. And also one of the challenges we had was, I don't know if you've ever uh, come across with the blog called White Guys Wearing an Oculus Rift. Uh, so this was one of the first moment VR was, was uh, appearing. And in this blog, it's, it's very funny because you can literally see a lot of white guys wearing this weird headset with their mouth opening, open, looking very odd. And so um, with this project, we were then uh, trying to avoid this awkward moment that you see from outside. And so uh, creating a structure that would then also be interesting for the people around it and uh, uh, looking at it. In fact, it was also the light that was coming out from, from um, this, this project was the same that the eventually was in the virtual world. So trying to break the boundaries between real and, and, and uh, and fictional. This is another project uh, that has a completely different outcome where basically uh, the story we were trying to, the story that we were trying to tell was actually um, you, via um, an, an AI that was talking directly to the audience um, with by a headset. Unfortunately here I cannot show um, pictures because it was a, a project done for the Volkswagen group so it was a, it's all secret but the idea it, I find it very fascinating so this is the, the idea that one, I want to share with you it was because basically we really wanted to um, invite the user to, to basically uh, explore an exhibition and speaking directly to each and every one, we would um, we would whisper in their ears and guiding them to the experience, so that they could then um, leave this this exhibition in a very personalized and special way. And then the last project that I want to show you before diving in the ocean altogether is um is a uh, it starts from a video that per perhaps you're quite familiar with this kind of videos um so it's a project using machine learning and uh as this this project i did it during the the confinement during the quarantine of uh, the pandemic that we're all living right now regardless of where you are i'm sure right now unfortunately we're all in this um and i found that the basically the um, the social distancing that we were living in this moment were, felt to me um, very similar to this to, to the gap between genders that we have these days. Um, there, it, it really felt uh, like a, a, a very true uh, experience. This this social distancing that we had normally, um, and and it really felt to me as a as a very true um, metaphor of the of of this gender gap that we have nowadays. So with this project I trained the machine on um, a stereotypical depiction, mainstream images of, of women, so the very objectified, very, you know, let's say very much of, of the pop culture. Um, and I'm sure you can picture yourself images of women with like nice red big lips, um, all looking pretty, uh, mostly white skin, and uh, so I fed, I fed a machine with all these images and then I let it basically uh, depict its own um, 
its own visualization, its own understanding of our world based on these very uh, stereotypical depictions. And then I, was, I basically um, moved through the latent space of the machine to try and find really the glitches that were actually trying to reveal the true gaze of the women that nowadays are hiding behind the stereotypes. So for example, um, strong and fierce um, uh, cases that are trying to move beyond um, this objectified uh, persona and really try and, and long for an equal society where we all stand equal together. Um, so these are some of the examples of the project. And um, now I want to move away from the pandemic, from being confined uh, in, a, in, a, in a, for example, in my case, in a small apartment, very small apartment in Paris. And I want to go on a, on a sailing boat where actually I met the Super Collider in May 2019 where uh, together with a Sail Britain, um, we went on an art, art residency uh, sailing, from, is, sailing in Scotland from Arthur St. to Auburn to two cities on the coast. And over one week, we basically uh, mix navigation, art and science. The, as you can see, the, we went on, as you can see from the image on the left, or probably on your right, uh, right now, I don't know, uh, we were aboard the Alcuin. And it was a, a super lovely crew of very different people, uh, from photographers to sound artists to um, artists working with, uh, with, for example, uh, particles coming from the air. And it was super inspiring because over this, um, very confined space. We traveled very far in in terms of, uh, um, yeah, in, in in this magical landscape that we that we discovered. Um, what I what I was doing on this boat was trying to use data. Oh, sorry, um, try to use data to understand a bit what is happening on the ocean. So as you can see in this video, I was gathering little samples of of water. And using this this uh, very simple um, well this these chemicals that you can use you you can use at home for for aquariums to try and 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 get data from the ocean to try to understand how with the pollution how with the with anthropocentric uh, influence we are changing the ocean itself and this is um, so I was I was moving I was like during this 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 trip I was gathering uh, small quantities of water and try to understand the ocean because nowadays now we're gonna we're gonna get into this a bit more with the project later but because of all all we are emitting in the in the air the ocean is changing so much um, and. I was really fascinated by how um, how this change is really affecting the chemistry of the water, which to us always seems blue, always seems the same. It's very hard to understand what how this is uh, changing its chemistry. And so I, out of this um, residency, I used this data to create this uh, wave that would change over time. Um, and as you can see here, this eventually was the, the outcome of this uh, installation, where a wave would get would would have, for, as you can see here, some red and, and yellowish spots um, symbolizing this change in the scene. This was very much an artistic in, uh, standpoint, uh, an artistic interpretation, but we are going to get uh, now onto a more um, scientific one. So now we arrive on, on diving into an acidifying ocean. So from our, from our sailing boat we arrive in the middle of the ocean and this is a project that as Melanie said uh, was done in collaboration with Google Arts and Culture and they approached me to answer a brief on climate change in general um, and I decided to uh, work on the ocean and try to understand how the ocean itself is changing due to the anthropocentric uh, anthropocentric um, impact. Uh, so this this work actually uses real data that comes from um, NOAA and the IPCC report um, and really vi tries to visualize it over time. So I'm gonna. Uh, before I go into more details, I'm going to play it and I'm, I'm going to talk over it to explain a bit further. 
So every second breath we take comes from the ocean. But this won't be for much longer. We're in the process of killing 96% of ocean life. Two hundred fifty-two million years ago, in an event known as the Great Dying, a massive release of carbon dioxide, CO two, and other gases caused extreme global warming, depleting the oceans of oxygen and acidifying the waters. Today, we are causing the same process to happen at a speed that surpasses that of the great dying by tens of thousands of years. Back then, life returned after 10 million years. If we fail to act, what will happen to ocean life and to us? So, Unfortunately, studies show that all that's happening right now in the ocean happened already many, many years ago and caused a, a massive um, uh, dying. Um, and um, unfortunately, what is happening today, it's happening at a speed that is much higher than that, that was happening back then. And this is all because of what we have been um, insert, emitting in the, in the air, the CO2 we've been emitting in the air. Basically, when CO2 is emitted in the air, it gets absorbed by the ocean and interacts with the, with the chemicals of the ocean. The, um, this, this, chemi this chemistry, uh, this chemistry, chemical change can be understood analyzing the pH, which is, a, which is one of the few data sets that you can see on the top right here. And basically, the pH can determine the level of acidity of a liquid. For example, you can say of a, of a lemon juice, of simply water, or uh, some, some of the chemistry used to wash your clothes, for example. And um, it's really changing. Uh, it, with, with the emission of CO2, it's becoming more and more acidic. And this is causing, unfortunately, um, uh, the... the elements, the molecules that are forming the heart structures in the water, not to form anymore. So this unfortunately has a, a tremendous impact on, on, on animals. And in fact, if you, in the experience, then you can encounter um, many different animals. And one by one, you can explore specifically what, what happens to them. Um, this uh, animation that you just saw is inspired by this animal, which is a pteropod. And the study really shows that when pteropods are placed in water with the same pH levels and CO2 that are projected for the year 2100, their shells start decaying within 48 hours and nearly completely dissolve within 45 days. So from a scientific study, I found some photos that were uh, depicting how this shell of this animal that you saw dissolving were actually dissolve, dissolving in water. And these images show that after 45 days, almost nothing was left of this shell. And so these images then became the foundation for this, this, this solution, this uh, animation that you just saw. This animal. They're really, um, it, it is really true that these animals, unfortunately, are disappearing. And so, yes, um, for, um, during the experience, you can, you can read uh, of what happens to all of them. So the experience itself um, has, a, has a timeline at the bottom. And sorry, I'm just read this. There's a timeline at the bottom where you can explore the ocean changing from it, the year 1860 to the year 2100. And over time, you can see how the planet's temperature is increasing, how the pH is becoming more acidic, and how um, the CO2 is being absorbed and oxygen is lost in the water. So a study has shown that since 1860, today the ocean is 30% more, acid, more acidic 
and by 2100 it will become 170 percent more acidic and this has had just deadly consequences in my life almost one third of carbon dioxide co2 is absorbed by the world's ocean this acidifies the water to a chemical process called ocean acidification this chemical process decreases our ocean's pH, its level of acidity, which has deadly consequences for much of marine life. Shells and skeleton dissolve, and marine animals' physiology changes. The animals encountered so far from, form the foundation of the marine, life, marine food web and represent the future of the oceans. But due to the dramatic changes taking place, they are also the ones suffering the most. So as we go over time, we start going also up the food chain and um, we, are, um, encounter we are understanding, we are encountering animals um, that are very different levels of this food chain. We are seeing how Ocean acidification, regardless of their position there, is affecting everybody. Um, so this shell actually is, <clears throat> is the very, very starting point of this project. So um, uh, I, I, in Italy, where I'm from, I'm, uh, I live on a, close to a beach. And uh, last summer, I collected a shell exactly like this one that I then, um, through a process called photogrammetry, I transformed it into uh, a 3D model. So basically, I took lots of pictures of the shell, and then through these pictures, I, f I created this 3D model, and then this 3D model, we imported it into a, a software that we created to create then this, uh, to, to bring this animal in this virtual ocean, let's say. Um, so the technique that we are seeing here it's that of a point cloud and that will the choice of this was because i i i thought um giving a very realistic look to all the animals was essential was important to really uh bring the user closer to understanding and empathizing with what is happening under the ocean and really discovering uh what is going on there and then the look of the point cloud we really allowed to create this dissolution, this dissolving animation and altering the shape um, and really uh, try and bring the science to, um, to, a, to an artistic um, take. So the ocean absorbs around 30% of the carbon dioxide that is released into the atmosphere. Since 1860, the ocean's pH has fallen by 0 0.1 pH units, from 8.2 to 8.1 pH. What seems like a small change of 0 0.1 actually means that today, the oceans are 30% more acidic. In humans, a drop of 0 0.1 pH units in the blood can result in seizures, coma, or even death. If we continue at this pace, by 2100, the oceans will be 170% more acidic, falling to a pH of around 7.6. Let's consider the huge consequences. Ocean acidification can precipitate ecological collapse. Research has shown that 66 million years ago, a drop in pH of 0.25 was enough to precipitate another mass extinction. And it was hundreds of thousands of years before life returned to normal. So as, as we move through time, we also start encountering this red line, what I call the acidic squills, which are gonna fill more and more um, the ocean. Octopus, Cep oh, cephalopod, sorry. When environmental hypoxia, a lack of oxygen in the water, and water acidification pressures are high, a cephalopod's blood is unable to take in a sufficient quantity of oxygen from their gills, 
and that's from asphyxiation, of course. Of course. So unfortunately, it isn't just ocean acidification that is transforming the ocean. It's also um, it's also the mix of all of the of all the all the chemical changes. So, for example, oxygen is starting to lack. This is, is the deoxygenation is starting to happen. Temperatures are rising, and all of these together are really um, making it hard for animals to survive. As you can start noticing, the ocean has started to change color. It's not blue, fully blue anymore. It started to be a bit um, yellow. And this is uh, very related to the pH uh, value data that we found here. So um, this is the most, uh, most scientifically relevant um, accurate, let's say, sorry, um, visualization in this project. So because, of course, it's an artistic proje project, there is, a, there is a, an interpretation here. But the, this, this data that you see here is visualized on the changing of the, of the ocean, of the color of the ocean. We're going to see that over time, it's going to become more and more red. Also, over time, we can see that we, it isn't just animal that we encounter. But for example, this is a ghost net. So oh, this is what I call the anthropocentric new animals, which aren't actually animals. They are just things that we have dumped in the sea and we have forgotten there. And are, they most likely will be there forever if they're made of plastic and are harming uh, countless life forms. For example, a ghost net, which is just a, goss, uh, a net that has been forgotten there, has been abandoned, it's not really feeding anybody. Um, on average, these nets entangle and harm between 30 to 40 marine animals per net when left in the ocean. And again, this isn't food that eventually will feed somebody, it will sustain uh, economies or people, it's just there to kill for no reason. another anthropocentric animal, food packaging. Uh, food packaging plastic waste accounts for just over 40% of total plastic usage. Over the last 10 years, more plastic has been produced than during the whole of the last century. And as we move on over time, we're gonna encounter less and less animal, more um, garbage and, and yeah, less life. Research shows that an, the increasing acidification of the oceans causes damage to the liver, kidney, pancreas, muscle tissues, and eyes of the yellowfin tuna uh, larvae within a week of exposure. So regardless in the food chain we are, if we are at the bottom, if we are at the top, all animals are equally uh, affected by ocean acidification. And this is one uh, of well, the worst. Plastic bottle. One million plastic bottles are bought around the world every minute. The number will jump another 20% by 2021, creating an environmental crisis that some predict will be as serious as climate change. If placed end to end, all these plastic bottles would extend more than halfway to the sun. Reports suggest that by 2021, this number will increase to 583.3 billion. It's just too much. So the ocean is slowly transforming, it's becoming more yellow. Uh, acidic swirls are filling the sea. We find less and less uh, sea uh, animals. In just 15 years, the global temperature is anticipated to exceed the 1.5 degree milestone. And after 2050, is expected to surpass the two degrees benchmark. This benchmark is a tipping point for the future of the oceans. With increasingly warmer temperatures around the world, we are depleting the oceans of oxygen and suffocating all life forms. And with today's additional stresses, including pollution and overfishing, we might have a complete breakdown of the whole food chain. Do we want oceans that are empty of life and only filled with our garbage?
these animals don't only sustain the modern ecosystem, they ultimately sustain us. Human beings and our economies, culture and communities depend on them. Jellyfish. Jellyfish are one of the oldest species on the planet, having existed for more than 540 million years. It's remarkable how much this creature can endure. But how do we keep our oceans from being predominantly full of jellyfish? Jellyfish are one of the few, if only the only animal that isn't negatively affected by uh, ocean acidification because they are mostly made of water. They're made of this gelatinous um, uh, sustenance um, and unfortunately because we are overfishing all their predators they are just free to 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 roam undisturbed in the oceans the ocean is emptier and emptier microplastic a 2015 study estimated that there was between 93 and 236,000 metric tons of microplastic in the world's oceans. Scientists are only just now discovering how much the problem of microplastic has spread. They studied the scale of 51 wild fur seal and discovered that 67% of the samples showed an abundance of microfibers. So these microfibers fibers that are coming from our clothes are entering the oceans from, yeah, from how we wash our clothes, that, there you go, then they enter the ocean. So it's really important then that we also um, pay attention to the material that we use to, to dress ourselves with. So the temperature is almost three degrees warmer. The pH is almost, well, now it's 135% more acidic. The ocean is taking 77% more CO2 and the, the loss of the oxygen is almost 6%, which is so much if we consider how, uh, how much oxygen every, every animal needs. We still have the power to help our oceans. But the time to act is now. What kind of ocean do you want to remember? These are some of the things I try to do to reduce my carbon footprint and act, uh, act consciously. And this is uh, something that anybody can do because, I mean, um, such changes really are government dependent, but anybody, any, any of us can do something to, to help. For example, recycle and use a compost for organic food, bike more and use uh, public transport or electric vehicles. Definitely refuse disposable plastic, eat local fish and avoid it when landlocked. Uh, look for sustainable labels, reduce meat intake and eat seasonal and local, and choose sustainable and clean energy. So this was a diving in a acidifying ocean. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm gonna move back to the 